We are happy to have uh, Dr. Uh, Joshua Isaacson from the uh, from lab telling us about how to measure the W mass A theory perspective. So please begin. Thank you for the invitation to give this talk. So I'm going to talk about sort of how I, as a theorist, view the measurement of the W mass with a focus on CDF. Uh, okay, so in the standard model, the W mass is actually, um, you know, you can define uh, three electroweak parameters and then you get all the other electroweak parameters um, from a prediction. And so you can actually predict the mass of the W uh, according to the standard model, given the mass of the Z, the fine structure constant and GF. And you can sort of then get this relationship between MW and those constants, plus you have this delta R term, which contains uh, loop corrections due to uh, the, the corrections to the fine structure constants, correction to the row parameter, and then terms that are proportional to the uh, Higgs mass. And so uh, you can then go and do a global fit to all the electric data available, um, and you can sort of fix some input parameters such as uh, GF and the fine structure constant at Q squared equals zero. And you can then uh, fit all these different parameters and you can see that you get a W mass of 80.3591 plus or minus 5.2 MeV. So this is a very, very precise extracted value that you get from doing this global fit. On the other hand, um, you can also experimentally measure this directly by sort of, um, you know, at these experiments, and you can sort of see the collection of different results um, that are available. And um, what's interesting to note is that the CDF run two result that recently came out is the most precise result. However, it has a seven sigma tension with this electroweak precision fit and the standard model. Additionally, I like to highlight the fact that there's this three sigma tension between ATLAS and CDF. Um, and so, you know, this sort of uh, raises some questions about, you know, what could have been different between ATLAS and CDF um, that causes this tension. And so I'm going to highlight some of the key differences between these two analyses. But again, the main focus will be on the CDF run two result. Um, additionally, I want to highlight uh, the LHCB result. Uh, so they're not included on this plot because this was reproduced from the CDF uh, paper and the LHCB result was published simultaneously with the CDF run two result. And it's just very exciting that LHCB was even able to make this measurement up. You know, I was super excited to see that they were able to do this um, in the first place. Um, although they have very large uncertainties, you know, there was a lot of questions of if they could even do this in the first place. And so the question is now, now that we have this collection of different measurements, how do you actually measure this from data? And, you know, one of the common things people do is you look for resonance, you know, you look for a bump. And um, in the case of the Z, this is, you know, you can actually do this, you know, you can look, you can look at the outgoing leptons, you can construct their invariant mass, you see this nice bright Wigner, and you can fit this and you can extract the mass and the width. However, um, with the W, the most sensitive channel is the leptonic channel, in which case you have a neutrino which you don't measure. And so you have to look at other observables, such as this transverse mass distribution, um, which is basically given here as a relationship between the PT of the lepton and the PT of the neutrino or the missing PT, um, whichever one you want to call it. And um, what's interesting to note is that um, looking at this distribution, you can't uh, look at it and say anywhere close to what the W mass was. You know, in the case of the Z, you can sort of eyeball roughly where that peak is and get a rough estimate of the Z mass. But for the W, you can't eyeball it and get the correct W mass. Um, you can also then use the PT of the lepton or the PT of the neutrino, which experimentally is just defined as uh, the vector difference of the um, the PT of the lepton and the PT of the whole hadronic activity in the detector. And so to actually go about extracting the W mass, you need a precise theory calculation that can predict this curve in agreement with data that has a tunable parameter, which is the W mass. And so the idea is that what you do is you take these theory calculations, you generate hundreds to thousands of W masses, and you see 
um, you do a chi-squared fit and you see which W mass most closely reproduces the data. And you say that is the W mass that we measured. And so this sort of then leads into um, questions about, you know, how do we actually do these precise theory calculations? And so the idea is that um, if you just want to do this in perturbation theory, you can calculate this order by order. And as you go to higher and higher orders in perturbation theory, what you will find is that um, the, the calculation has terms that goes like alpha s to the n times log to the m of the pt squared of the w over the mass of the w squared. Um, and here m is less than equal to 2n. And so you can just look at this and you can see that as PT goes to zero, this term goes larger than one. And so your, uh, perturba your perturbation uh, series no longer converges. Um, and so you have to sort of figure out how do you handle this? And so there was this technique that was introduced that um, you know, people started looking at this and they noticed that the coefficients of all of these terms took a very specific form, and you could formally show that these coefficients could actually be resummed um, analytically, so you can get a, an all orders calculation. And so by doing these all orders calculations, you're able to get this nice um, comparison to uh, the data. So this is the PT of the Z data from CDF um, run two. Um, and you can see the Resbos prediction, the Resbos 2 prediction that lies nicely within the data and it behaves nicely as the PT goes to zero because we have analytically resummed, um, you know, these divergent terms to all orders. And so sort of, um, you know, I've been focusing so far on the analytic approach, but uh, one of the key differences between what CDF did and what Atlas did that I like to highlight is that, um, you know, CDF used an analytic resummation formalism, mainly the Resbos code. Um, and so this is formal resummation. Uh, it's done in impact parameter space or B space. And it's used, and um, what they used was the Collins over Sturman resummation formalism. So that's going to be the main focus of this. There are other formalisms out there. Um, and, you know, there's this long ongoing benchmarking study comparing all these different analytic um, resummation formalisms. The nice benefit of doing an analytic calculation is that you can go to arbitrarily high precision and accuracy. You know, you just basically have to be able to push your perturbation calculations to higher and higher orders. And once you get the right terms, um, you, you know how to resum them appropriately to get this all orders calculation. However, um, you know, there's some drawbacks to this. So, you know, you, you don't just get the, you know, you can't just get the best of everything. And so one of the major cons is that this is inclusive only. You know, you set up initially what your final state particles are. And um, as you do this calculation, you get no information, for example, on the PT of the jets or how many jets or any of this type of information. So you lose all of this. And so this is sort of one of the downsides of these analytic approaches. Additionally, similar to how higher order calculations start to become more and more numerically expensive, these calculations are much more numerically expensive than the alternative approach. Um, the alternative approach is sort of um, what I like to call numerical resummation, or um, as many people call it, parton showers. And there is, you know, tons of different parton shower algorithms on the market. And I feel like there's new ones that come out almost every other year. Um, the key ones that people have heard of are Pythia, Sherpa, Herwig, Dyer, and Vincia. And some of the pros of doing these numerical uh, resummation approaches is that you get all those exclusive final states. So you can basically tell me exactly how many jets you had, how they're distributed in your detector, all of this information. Um, it's also much quicker uh, in comparison to doing these analytic approaches because of, you know, you tend to be stuck at lower orders um, and you use uh, slightly different techniques to actually evaluate them. Um, the major drawback to this approach is that you only capture what we call the leading log um, effects. And, you know, you get some subleading log effects. There's a lot of debate in the community of exactly how accurate these parton showers are formally. And there's been a lot of ongoing effort to try to bring this to next to leading log accuracy. Again, I just want to point out um, that the analytic is what CDF used for their analysis. 
and the Atlas WMAS was using these part-time showers, um, in particular Pythia. Um, so just to uh, sort of summarize how the numerical ones work before I really go into the details of the analytic approach, um, when you do a part-time shower, the idea is that you have some observable that is evaluated at some you know, scale, and you want to evolve this to a different scale, and you can do this by basically taking the splitting kernels and sort of evaluating them, um, you know, this running and uh, convoluting it with the uh, splitting function at a different scale. And so you can actually then run this evolution. This is typically done using these Markovian um, Monte Carlo algorithms, where you basically treat PAB as a probability. Uh, these um, virtual corrections are then uh, defined by this plus uh, prescription. So this is how you can capture the virtual corrections of the splitting kernels at the kinematical endpoints. So you can just turn the crank and get your uh, parton showers through this algorithm. Uh, moving on to the Collins over Sturman formalism and the analytic uh, approach, which will be the focus of the remainder of this talk. Um, this is sort of uh, what you get. So you get your resummed cross section um, fully differentially is given um, as a combination of a bunch of components. Um, I'm sort of going to highlight the key pieces to focus on. So you have your electric weak cross section. Sort of this is, you know, your born matrix element, you know, your tree level cross section that you can calculate. Um, you then have um, in this W piece, you have the Sudikoff form factor. Um, and you have your, so the Sudikoff form factor, I should say, captures the soft contributions to your calculation. And then you have the collinear factors, which calculates the hard collinear pieces. And so you can see these are sort of uh, convolutions with PDFs. Um, I want to highlight out that there's these three coefficients. So, so there's the C coefficient, this A coefficient, and these B coefficient. And these are the coefficients that you can um, calculate uh, order by order in perturbation theory and sort of just plug in into this formalism to sort of improve your formal accuracy. And when I talk about formal accuracy, um, the, this is how you can sort of define them. Um, so this has uh, sort of been a long debated, how do we sort of standardize the definitions? It took a lot of discussion to get to this point. And so I just wanna highlight um, and explain the notation and uh, language that I'm gonna be using when I say what orders things are done at. You can sort of understand uh, what components are actually included. So um, as I mentioned, leading log is this LL. And so this boundary condition is the same as the order that C coefficient is calculated to. Basically, what is the hard collinear piece that you have calculated, um, like what the accuracy to? Uh, so then you, and then you also have the anomalous dimension. You have the cusp anomalous dimension and the beta function. And so this is um, the same as that A coefficient. And so when you have leading log, you only have the one loop correction there. And then you also have the non-cusp anomalous dimension. Um, and so you can see, again, the order that is calculated at leading log. So at leading log, there is no contribution. And then you have to then eventually, uh, since this is all done, uh, when you do this resummation, you're basically taking the limit that QT goes to zero. And so eventually, you know, as you, as you want to compare this to data, you can't just look at, you know, very small QT. You have to look at the whole QT range. And so eventually you have to uh, match to, to a fixed order calculation. And so this is sort of the order in which um, you have matched to at high uh, transverse momentum. Um, I just want to point out some features. You'll notice that if you'll if you see you'll see that there's this um, you know starting here at next leading log. You'll see that um, the next leading log that the um, or that always the cusp anomalous dimension is always one order higher than the non-cusp anomalous dimension. And you'll notice that the difference between the unprimed, so like NLL unprimed and NLL prime, is simply the bound the order the boundary condition is calculated to. So NLL has the boundary condition is one order below the non-cusp, whereas the prime means it's the same order as the non-cusp. And I just want to highlight a few specific lines in this table that um, are going to be the focus of the remainder of this talk. Uh, so this one here highlighted in red is the accuracy that was used by the CDF um, analysis. 
And so this is sort of the precision that was used during their whole calculation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Resbos code is now able to go to n cubed LL plus NNLO accuracy. And uh, all the terms and some preliminary results have actually been done to n cubed LL prime. Um, the Resbos code is still in the process of adding in these this last term. Uh, and so the questions that people kept bringing up is, what effect does going to this one higher order have on the result that CDF measured? And so that's sort of what we're going to go and aim to investigate um, in the remainder of this talk. Um, but before we go into that, uh, you know, I was talking about the Sudikoff factor and the Sudikoff factor uh, has this integral over um, B space. And since you have to sort of evaluate this over all of B space, since this is a Fourier transform, uh, eventually you're going to have to go in a region in which B goes to, um, so you have to go where B goes to infinity, and then this lower bound of your integral goes to zero. When this lower bound of your integral goes to zero, you start having to evaluate things at scales that go towards zero. And so again, these A's are uh, and Bs are perturbative series. So they're, you know, perturbative series in alpha S. And since alpha S runs, you have to evaluate it at the scale mu bar. So eventually mu bar um, goes into a scale of C1 over B, which becomes non-perturbative. And we don't know how to calculate this, calculate this anymore. And so you have to introduce some method of separating the non-perturbative physics from the perturbative physics. And the approach that the Resbos code takes is we use this B star prescription. So you introduce this new parameter B max, uh, which is sort of little, yep. Uh, quick question: What is little b? Little b. This is the impact parameter. So it's the uh, Fourier conjugate to the transverse momentum. Does that answer your question? Uh, I think so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's. It, I can go back here. It's just this right so this is this part right here is just a 40 a 2d fourier transform and so you see the qt and the b are just uh fourier uh, conjugates of each other um but you can also think about this uh and if you want to think about this in physics it's basically um the impact parameter so how far apart the two uh uh partons were at closest approach if you if you want as well so that's sort of the physics picture um, and so eventually, you know, you have to have this cutoff. We introduce this new scale B max, which is sort of the maximum value we trust our calculation to remain perturbative. And so now that we have introduced this uh, new cutoff, we have actually modified this integral. And so we then have to introduce a non-perturbative function to recapture those pieces that we have now neglected. And the form that was used by uh, CDF was this BLNY form, which is given here. And I just want to highlight some of the key components here. Um, the main one is this G2. And so this G2, it goes in front of this log Q over 2Q naught. And this term is actually predicted um, by the Colin Soper evolution kernel. So this is a QCD prediction that, you, that the non-perturbative function should have some functional form that goes like log Q over Q naught. Um, the other term here, this G, uh, this G3 term um, with this X1 and X2 is, was introduced in the BLNY formalism to capture the collider energy dependence. Um, so, you know, there's the fixed target experiments, there's the Tevatron experiments, there's the LHC experiments, and all of these should have the same, uh, you know, a very similar description of the non-perturbative physics. And so you have to have some way that sort of scales uh, sort of how this non-perturbative function changes as you change that collider scale energy. Uh, this last term G1 is just a Gaussian term that's used to capture any other uh, functional form that we didn't think of uh, when they introduced this form in the first place. Um, the key points I want to draw your attention to is that G1 and G3, um, what CDF does is they leave those as what was extracted in the global fit that was done by the BLNY uh, paper. However, they modified G2 in the, the non-perturbative form and um, you know, alpha S at MZ 
uh, they tune these values such that they can exactly reproduce the PTZ distribution. And so this is going to be a key point that we come back to is that um, CDF uses a data-driven method to tune the theory prediction. And this is going to be key when we get to sort of the effect of higher order corrections. Um, I want to point out that this difference between MW and MZ, uh, you know, you might say, well, MZ and MW aren't the same, so, you know, shouldn't you worry about this? But that's actually captured by this Colin Soper evolution kernel, this uh, log Q over Q naught term. Uh, some things to point out is that uh, throughout this, I have mentioned nothing about the flavor. And so there's a lot, been a lot of questions about, you know, since the W and the Z have different flavor structures of the initial state, what role does flavor play in the non-perturbative function? And also questions have been raised about um, if I were to use a completely different functional form, uh, how much does that change my extracted W mass, you know, as an additional uncertainty that wasn't considered? And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and I reflected on some of my previous work where I looked at these two different functional forms. So these are drastically different functional forms um, that were both that were all fit to the same data. And you can see that there's very small differences here. Um, so I don't think it's going to be a dominant um, effect, especially once you take into account the fact that then you can retune this again. So this was from the global fit. So again, you would retune this to fit this data, which would help to wipe away some of these differences that you see. Um, however, again, the flavor dependence is something that that may have some effect, um, just because Z and W are treated differently. So you could tune uh, up and down slightly differently to get agreement with CD with the Z data, but cause a shift in the W data. And so there's this one, there's only been one study on the flavor dependence, um, you know, that I've seen. Um, there's been a lot of work on the lattice recently, but there's one that really looked into the effect on MW. And so what they do is they basically uh, only focused on the 7TEV LHC result, um, focusing basically on the Atlas paper that came out. And what they looked at is they basically came up with a non-perturbative functional form in which they have this GA coefficient in which the flavor dependence comes in, and then they have this GEVO term, which is uh, proportional to that uh, Colin Soper uh, evolution kernel. And so this term is not flavor dependent because QCD predicts it to be not flavor dependent, and all the flavor dependence is um, lumped into this one coefficient. They then go through a bunch of different parameterizations of uh, GA, different values that you can get, and they go through, turn the cranks, and extract the shift in the W mass that they find. And they find that um, in a certain kinematical region, you know, for one of their sets, for one of the distributions, that the shift could be up to 10 MeV. So this could be a large effect. However, it's unclear what the global shift would be, because if you look at this table here, you can see that even though there's the shift upwards by 9 MeV, you can see that there's this downward shift in MT and in the W minus. And so if you were to then combine this in a global uh, fit, you know, th this would all get reduced and it's unclear um, exactly what the final result would be, because that is much more involved and requires a lot of experimental um, turning of cranks and these types of things to really get all your systematics uh, controlled properly in the combination. Um, but it's just something that, that needs to be investigated for, uh, for CDF as well. So there's, there's ongoing efforts to sort of redo this um, for, for CDF, for the CDF result and the Tevatron energies. Um, before I get into the results, I just want to highlight, um, as I mentioned, you know, uh, there's a lot of these issues with computational costs. And so there's, I just want to highlight some of the speed improvements that went into this code to really allow us to push to this higher accuracy. You know, the previous version of the Resmus code would not have been able to do this in a reasonable amount of time. And so these speed improvements really helped to make the code, um, you know, actually usable and, and uh, able to get results in a worth in a uh, short enough period of time. And so this is sort of this technique that's known as Ogata integration. Um, it's a very interesting technique that was developed that basically you can look at um, 
you know, you can take a 2D Fourier transform and turn it into a convolution with a Bessel function. And so they basically showed that if you had an integral from zero to infinity of some function with a Bessel function, that you can then write this out in terms of, you know, uh, uh, sorry, you can write this out as a, as a quadrature sum where you have a truncation error. Basically, you have to cut it off at some point. So you miss some terms. You have a fact that you are taking these finite steps, um, you know, because you can sort of, in this approach, you can sort of change how big your quadrature steps are. And so you can have an uncertainty that's introduced from there. So you sort of want to tune these two to sort of minimize uh, your, your, you know, your missing terms so you can trust your integration. Um, you then want to choose to evaluate your function at some step size times the zeros of the Bessel function. <clears throat> and then you then introduce this quadrature weight that you have to multiply your function by to account for the fact that you're now doing this um, quadrature approach um, to reproduce the correct integral. And um, I just want to highlight the results from this paper back in 2019 where they basically showed a way to optimize this, this H parameter such that you can drastically minimize the number of function evaluations you need to, um, to actually get an accurate calculation. And so I just want to point out here. Um, um, so the reason this, devi <coughs> sorry, uh, the reason this deviates um, from the data at higher PT is due to the fact that um, they don't have the matching to the fixed order. And so this is where the resummation formalism breaks down because log QT over Q becomes large. Um, in this region, you can see that there's very good agreement with the data and that they only use 12 function evaluations or even six and they can get this good agreement. On the other hand, in the old uh, Resbos approach, we use this like quadrature approach. And in order to get a similar um, level of agreement, we need something like 400 to 1,000 function evaluations. And so this is basically a speed up of a factor of 100 <coughs> in terms of computational cost. And so this drastically in improves the way that um, the Resbos code is able to um, go to higher orders. Sorry, one second. <clears throat> So we have actually gone through into the Resbus code and we have uh, implemented these um, and we see these drastic improvements with no loss of accuracy um, in our calculations. One of the other major concerns that people have brought up in terms of criticisms of the CDF result was in terms of the angular coefficients. And what I mean by the angular coefficients here is that <coughs> When you're doing these calculations, the uh, leptons um, have angular correlations based off of the decay. And you can sort of characterize them um, with this equation where you have these A0, A1, so on and so forth in front of these, um, you know, uh, these uh, angular functions. And you can actually then project out these angular functions experimentally um, by calculating these moments and then ex experimentally extract what the coefficients are. And so there was this well-known problem in the angular coefficients at the Resbos code that if you were to use the NNLO matching, that you wouldn't get them correct. Um, however, uh, at NLO, there was no issue with this. Uh, CDF run two only used the NLO, so the angular, fu uh, the angular functions were exact to that order. Um, the, the reason this issue came up is that the Resbos code contained um, only a NNLO correction to the total rate, but they didn't include um, the NNLO, they didn't appropriately account for um, you know, the decay of the Z. And so this is sort of where this comes in. Um, you know, it basically assumes you're producing an on-shell Z without decaying it, and you sort of neglect the fact that the Z then has to decay and you lose this angular information. Uh, however, this is an issue in terms of matching and uh, the actual fixed order calculations, and it wasn't an issue with the, the, re the main focus of the Resmus code, which is resummation. 
Uh, and so uh, the other thing is that these deviations are really only important for larger PT because um, as you'll see when I show the plots, uh, and I can explain here that um, at leading order, only this coefficient here, this one plus cosine squared theta coefficient, and this A4 coefficient, this cosine theta coefficient, those are the only ones that are non-zero as the transverse momentum of the Z goes to zero. And so all these other coefficients um, you know, uh, are zero in this region, and those were the ones that had issues. The leading coefficient and the A4 coefficient um, were okay. Um, and so these effects only become significant in the PT of around 30 GeV, and CDF had a cut at 15 GeV. Um, but uh, even with all of this, in the results I'm going to show, uh, this has actually been resolved with matching to MCFM. Um, and so we have actually done this and we have actually corrected these coefficients. And so you can sort of see here um, some preliminary results on uh, the Resbos plus MCFM interface in which we calculate these A0 coefficients and compare it to the ATLAS data. And you can see here that the, you know, we have this good agreement between the theory prediction and the data. And I wanna point out that the uncertainties so far here are just the statistical uncertainties um, we still have to overlay the scale uncertainties and the PDF uncertainties. But it still, you know, follows the right trend. You know, there's no major uh, issues that seem to be sticking out. You can then move to the A2 coefficient. Um, and again, you can see that there's good agreement. And the one that was really uh, a concern that people really noticed was this A0 minus A2 coefficient. And so at NLO, this is predicted to be exactly zero. And it's not until next to next to leading order in which you see a breaking of this relationship that A0 minus A2 is zero. And so you can see again here that with this new approach, we reproduce the data. And so this is you know, showing that we have actually gone through and we have actually fixed um, you know, these, eight, these concerns about the angular coefficients, and we have actually improved the accuracy of the calculation. There's, so the question now is, what happens when you put all of this together and compare it to what CDF did versus what the, the new improved Resbos code would, would predict the W mass to be? And so the first thing that you have to look at is that um, you wanna look at uh, the PTZ to PTW ratio. Um, because this ratio sort of tells you how do you map um, some of your experimental components that you measured and calibrated with the Z to the W. And so you want to look at this ratio. And this ratio is actually stable to higher order correction. So as we go to higher and higher orders, um, this ratio doesn't seem to be largely affected. Um, at higher PT, it's still within the scale uncertainties. And I wanna point out that this is done in the most aggressive uncertainty approach where we correlate the scale variations between the Z prediction and the W prediction. Um, if you let the Z scales and the W scales uh, vary differently, so you treat the scales as uncorrelated, you get a much larger uncertainty band. So it's even easier to show that they are consistent within scale uncertainties. Um, we still have to go through, uh, CDF gives an uncertainty that's induced by looking at this ratio. We still have to go through and um, see if we agree with their value and to redo it um, for a higher order correction. But again, they use a data-driven approach. So it's a lot of, you know, trying to get, you know, all the small pieces done correctly. And so sort of uh, moving on to actually, how do we actually extract the shift in MW. And so our procedure that we take to sort of evaluate this is that we are going to generate pseudo data um, for both the Z and the W at N3LL accuracy plus NNLO. And then we are gonna take our NNLL plus NLO prediction and we're going to tune G2 and alpha S just as CDF did to reproduce our pseudo data. Once we have uh, tuned it to reproduce the pseudo data for PTZ, we're going to take that tune prediction and look at PTW just to make sure things aren't going crazy. 
once we have ensured that uh, you know things are looking okay when we translate between the two, we're going to take that tuned result and we're going to generate a ton of mass templates at different values of MW, just as the CDF experiment did. We're then going to take each of those mass templates and we're going to fit them. We're going to calculate a, how well they fit to this uh, n cubed LL plus NNLO uh, prediction, the pseudo data. And we're going to get um, the W mass that's predicted for each of the different observables that CDF measured. From this, we can then, since we know what the input mass was for our theory prediction, and we know what our extracted mass was, we can calculate the shift um, in the mass that you obtain. And so um, the way these shifts are going to be done is that if you see a positive result, that means it's shifting towards the standard model. It means that the um, approach, the this that the lower order prediction predicted a mass that was higher than if you used a higher order accuracy. If you see a negative result, it means that the higher order prediction pr predicted a result that was lower than what the suit, what the input uh, prediction was. Um, for this, we're going to use uh, MW at 80, uh, sorry, that should be 385. Um, and uh, then we have this, um, and the choice of the mass doesn't really matter because it's just a central prediction. Um, and so if you vary these in different ways, uh, it doesn't really make a difference. And so it's just an arbitrary choice. Um, this is just a typo. I accidentally transposed the five and the eight. Um, we then use the exact same cuts that uh, CDF did, with the exception of the PTW. We only limit ourselves to 15 GeV, or sorry, the PT of the Z. We only limit ourselves to 15 GeV instead of 30 GeV, since the W is also only done to 15 GeV. And it just, um, you know, uh, some of the the tuning, uh, we didn't have the same flexibility that uh, CDF had because um, they used. Uh, a lot of more computational powers and made some approximations to sort of uh, tune it more precisely. We don't have those same knobs. Uh, and so sort of the higher PT region is was uh, more difficult to fit, but shouldn't have any impact on this region of interest that um, we care about for extracting the WMS. Um, again, everything else again is the same. The PTs uh, is the same as the uh, CDF result, the rapidity of the leptons, the invariant mass for Z events, the transverse mass for W events. Um, in the following plots, you're going to see um, statistical uncertainties on the pseudo data. Those statistical uncertainties are not the uncertainty of the data we actually generated. We generated much higher statistics. We just have then rescaled the number of events to match the CDF values. So you can see an un a statistical uncertainty that comes from CDF to help guide the eye to see how good the fit is. Since you know, looking at it you know, otherwise is very hard to say, is that a good fit or is that not a good fit? So we just sort of have these error bands to sort of you know, help you uh, visualize if the, if, you, if the mass that we say the best template fit was really looks like a good fit to the data. And so here is actually the, you know, going through the procedure of tuning it. So we take this um, N3LL plus NNLO prediction and we tune this uh, NNLL plus NLO uh, result until we get as precise, as close to the Z data as we can. And so you can see here, you know, the statistical uncertainty that would be, that CDF would have had compared to the tuned result here in red. So this looks like a very good agreement. Um, when we did this tune, we uh, had to change G2. So this is our refitted G2 value to do this prediction. And we had to tune alpha S to this new alpha S value. One of the things that's different than the way CDF did this is we actually um, changed the PDF set as we changed alpha S. Whereas um, if I understand what CDF did correctly, um, they did not change the PDF set as you change alpha S. And so this sort of adds, you know, to this difficulty of doing this fit at higher PTs. We can then look and validate against the W. And so it's not as good as the Z, but you can see it's still um, a fairly good fit and um, something that we say is acceptable and should not be introducing any large uh, systematic shifts in our final results. 
Um, so now that we have tuned it and validated it, we can actually take this result and we can actually compare it to what you would extract the mass to be. And so as you go through and you extract the mass, you can compare it to the MT of your result, uh, the PT of the lepton and the PT of the neutrino. So you can go through, extract those values, um, and you get the different ones for the different observables. You can sort of look at the spread of the uh, tuned result to the data, and you can see that they are all within the statistic, what you would expect from statistical fluctuations. So you can then go and say how much is a shift this would be, and you can see this is sort of, you know, of the order of a few MeV. Um, you can then sort of model some detector effects and uh, final state interaction of um, effects. And I should say that this first uncertainty here is just the statistical uncertainty that we have since we gen didn't generate an infinite number of events for all these different pieces. We have some uncertainty that's induced um, due to this. And so that's just given here. Uh, we can then do this detector effect. And so you have again here in this first, this is the uncertainty that you get from the statistics and the second column is um, since this since the way we're simulating detector effects is basically the smearing uh, we basically changed the random seed and did this whole procedure you know a hundred times and calculated the uncertainty that you um, extract from the different detector effects to sort of get an uncertainty induced by our our detector um, you know our detector simulation that we you know came up with and so you can see if you look at this result, um, we don't do the combination because it's unclear exactly how you would uh, combine them correctly. But you can see that our result is sort of, you know, it's going to be dominated by MT, but still contributed from PTL and uh, the PT of the neutrino. And so we like to quote that, um, you know, the shift is a few MeV, uh, but it's consistent with no shift. Um, and it's also consistent with about uh, you know a six seven eight um, MeV shift towards the standard model uh, at at two sigma, and so uh, this really does not explain uh, the deviation that CDF sees from the standard model. So it's not uh, the theory calculation that was used by CDF. This cannot bring their prediction back in line with the standard. Um, and so there's a lot of questions that are still going around and things that need to be investigated. And so some future studies that, um, that I'm working on that many people are looking, starting to look into is to uh, investigate the effect of the non-perturbative functional form on MW, as I mentioned already, uh, to really look into this flavor dependence. And I think this is a key place to go and look because these uh, flavor dependent pieces, um, you know, uh, you could tune U and D differently to still fit the PTZ data and have a, a larger effect on MW. Um, so it's an interesting place to go investigate. Um, we, I want to look at, and uh, our collaboration, the Resmus Group, wants to look into uh, more detailed studies on this PTZ to PTW ratio and uh, how you go through this, turn your cranks, and turn this into an MW uncertainty, and really, again, redo the, uh, the CDF approach. Um, to really see if that we can show those results. And again, this is a data-driven approach. And so um, this helps to, you know, following this approach helps to deal with a lot of questions of how do you handle the scale uncertainty since they sort of limit the scales based off of their experimental data. Um, we are in the process of talking with the experimentalists. There's this um, working lecture week working group um, at the LHC looking specifically on how do you do a joint combination of the previous um, CDF result uh, and the, D, the D0 result and the ATLAS result. And so they're sort of looking into how you do this. They have the, the full detector simulation that was used by CDF. So we're, we're discussing with them sort of the next steps on sort of improving these studies and really trying to understand, um, you know, what else could have gone wrong with the CDF result to sort of just help rule out uh, any questions of whether there's something wrong or to actually find if there's a bunch of these small effects that slowly add up to explain why they see this de deviation. Um, and then so just to sort of bring this all together and to conclude and wrap this up, um, 
you know, CDF used the Resmos code, um, which at the time when they froze the analysis back in 2011, was only able to do things at NNLL plus NLO accuracy. A lot of people criticize them for not using higher accuracy, um, but, you know, they froze their analysis and that was the choice they made and they stuck with it. Um, this, you know, the fact that they see this large deviation raised a lot of concerns about, well, what would have happened if you were able to go to higher accuracies, if you were able to really do this at higher precision. And so the new Resmos code, the, the V2 version, can go to N3LL plus NNLO accuracy. Uh, additionally, this, um, this new version corrects these uh, incorrect Angular co uh, functions in the Resmos code. And so by taking both this higher order um, effect and these correct Angular functions, we mimicked the CDF analysis, really tuning um, our lower order prediction to reproduce our pseudo experiments at higher accuracy. And we find that the, the, the shift um, after doing all this procedure, this data-driven approach, um, we find that the shift in the W mass that you, can, that you would obtain from this is consistent with no shift at all, but could be up to 10 MeV sort of at a two sigma level. It's, you know, it's very hard to really pin down a firm number. So we're being fairly conservative when we say that this is the most it could be. So at most, um, it would shift it uh, towards the standard model by 10 MeV, which still is not enough to explain, you know, it brings it from seven sigma to six sigma. And so it's really not enough to explain the deviation that is observed uh, by CDF. And so, again, there's just a lot of things to still look at, but the issue of higher order corrections is not sufficient to explain um, the CDF result disagreement with the standard model. So again, I'd like to thank you all for inviting me to give this presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Have a nice talk. Uh, other questions or comments? Yeah, regarding the uh, Atlas analysis you mentioned at the beginning, you pointed out that they use only uh, leading logs with some uh, corrections. So it would, of course, be interesting to know how how large is the error due to due to that. Could that have been underestimated? So I was wondering if you could essentially give an estimate of that error by running Resbos at LL and then comparing to N cubed LL. Okay, yeah, so um, you can't do that directly this way because there's a lot of data-driven modifications that are done by Atlas. And so again, you'd have to go through this whole data-driven approach because even though they use a leading log accurate part-on shower, they reweight their rapidity distribution to next to next to leading order. They do some other reweightings and other observables. They, you know, you'd have to go through and exactly reproduce their whole procedure and then compare it um, to the Resmos prediction. And this is something I'm looking to do, but this is again, a very involved analysis and we just haven't had the time to really go through all those details yet. Fair enough, thank you. Okay, other questions from a uh, remote audience? Okay, I, uh, thank you for the nice presentation. So in the last line, uh, you are mentioning the uh, possible shift up to 10 MeV. And is this shift in either direction, plus, both plus and minus direction? Uh, no, this is only towards the standard model by 10 MeV. The, the zero is actually like, you know, like a little over one sigma in the other direction. So it's not like central on zero. Um, it's slightly, it's like the central value is like two-ish 
one, two ish MEV closer to the standard model. And I, another question is about uh, uncertainties from the choice of the PDF. Uh, yes, uh, so we investigated that um, and uh, we again did this comparison. We use CT18 as our central value and we look through all the different PDFs. And so here you can see sort of the shift that you have from the CT18 at next to next to leading order um, is all these first values. Um, and the second value is the PDF uncertainty that you get from the different PDF sets. Um, and uh, so in order to really get down to this 3.9 MEV that's quoted from CDF, you really have to go through and uh, basically combine these three PDFs across the whole, the next next leading order PDFs across the whole board and um, for over the three observables and do a lot of this combination. And um, we don't have all the information from the experimentalist to actually do this completely. And so we just sort of, you know, eyeballed it and say that um, if you just take like one of these, um, so it's dominated by MT, but it's going to be affected by this, this um, shift and they use this uh, NNPDF 3.1, you can see sort of that, um, you know, it's not, you know, crazy if they got something that's 3.9 MeV of a shift, like uncertainty, I should say. So, so we we can't, we haven't actually been able to pin it down all the way to a single number because we can't do the combination, but um, at least roughly uh, the result that they quote is not uh, ridiculous. Thank you. And One more question. So, uh, so uh, how to say? Uh, so, in the future, in the near future, uh, which experiment can uh, can uh, present a result which is uh, competent with the CDF two result in terms of the uncertainties? Um, so there's, there was an interesting thesis that I uh, recently stumbled upon uh, shortly after the CDF2 run result came out. And um, this was a thesis by a CMS experimentalist that basically went through and did the whole analysis. Um, and they used additional constraints uh, from the angular coefficients. So they didn't just fit MW, but they fit MW and these angular coefficients. And by doing this joint analysis, they were able to show that they could get a uh, uncertainty on MW of, you know, roughly nine MEV as well. So they, this is this nice, beautiful thesis written out on how to do this. Um, however, this person has now left the field. Um, so it's unclear if um, and, you know, and this was all like preliminary study, so it's unclear what will happen when um, the experimentalists actually go through and do this procedure, and um, it's unclear um, if they have, if there's any experimentalists who are willing to put the time, I mean, now with the CDF run two result, I'm sure there's some, but it's very hard to get people to really commit to doing a five, 10 year analysis just to get MW out. You know, it's a very, very complicated thing to do. Um, it took CDF uh, for this run two result about 10 years. Um, I don't think we'll see anything from Atlas or CMS for at least another two, three years at the, at the shortest period, probably closer to five years. Um, but I think Atlas and CMS should be able to get, you know, down to like 10 MEV-ish, 9, 10 MEV. Um, Beyond that, uh, you'd have to, the best thing to do would be to build an E plus E minus collider, but I have no idea what the prospects of actually doing that are. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, are there further questions or comments?
Okay, uh, are there questions or comments from uh, people attending remotely via Zoom? Okay, if there are no more questions or comments, we might thank uh, Dr. Isasun again. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Thank you for having me.